Yeah, okay, perfect. All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, good evening, good morning, and good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from, uh, where you're listening from, I guess. So um, welcome to this uh, presentation called Open All the Things, Science, Software, Health, um, whatever. It's just, I don't actually know what this is going to be about, and I'm quite excited to hear from uh, Dana Lewis here, who is joining us all the way from Seattle today. So uh, Dana is an absolute leader in the field of sort of DIY science, and it, I'm very proud that she's joined us today, taking the time to join us. So she's the creator of the do-it-yourself pancreas system, which I'm really looking forward to hear about, as well as the founder of the open source artificial pancreas system movement, which is uh, hashtag open APS, and is otherwise a, uh, a passionate advocate of patient-centered, driven, and designed research. Um, and with that, I'll stop rambling and turn off my mic again. And Dana, over to you. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks, John, for having me on. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about open science, open software, open healthcare, and how that all comes together from my perspective. But I first want to talk with giving a little bit of context about diabetes. Most people don't realize that if you get diagnosed with a chronic disease, it's actually like being struck by lightning. You don't really have a way to prepare for it. And so it's very, very overwhelming and there's a lot that you have to do. And there's a very clear before when everything was fine, even if you were getting ready to be diagnosed and you could tell that something was wrong and understanding the after where you suddenly have to completely change the way you live your life. And in type one diabetes, people think it's actually easy because you're able to take insulin, measure blood your blood glucose and to go about your business. But what most people don't realize is that living with type 1 diabetes is a lot of work. In manual diabetes, you have to get data about your glucose. You have to have data about your insulin dosing, which might come from an insulin pump, and decide constantly what needs to be done. And this is also complicated by the fact that at any given time, food could be in your system, which kicks in in about 15 minutes, whereas insulin itself, it has an action time in your body of six to seven hours and peaks in 60 to 90 minutes. And so it's really complex and hard to understand the timing of exercise, which you can't really measure, and the effects of food and insulin constantly over and over again. So that's why diabetes is so much work because several times a day, upwards of dozens times a day, you're having to make these complex decisions. And so the beautiful thing about putting a computer into the mix of this is that a computer can be taught to read this data every time there's a new data point, which happens to be every five minutes coming from the continuous glucose monitor, and it can read data from the insulin pump and decide what to do over and over again and make small changes about whether you need more or less insulin. And the human doesn't have to be paying attention all the time, and the human isn't having to make these large decisions with this huge margin of error, the human can intervene or do whatever they want and the system will work in the background and kick in as needed. And so that's where I got into open source and open source healthcare in particular was developing a open source closed loop system like this that we call open APS. And this is what it looks like today. You can see you've got an insulin pump and a continuous glucose monitor with a small computer, which is maybe what you didn't expect a computer to look like these days, but there's some great off the shelf hardware that can be used for projects like this and on the right side you can see a visualization of what's actually happening inside the computer. The green line represents the blood glucose changing over time and the blue line up and down is representing the changes in insulin delivery compared to the dotted line which would be what I would be normally getting at the time. And so what the system is doing over and over again is making predictions about what is likely to happen to the blood sugar, given the information it has about food and insulin and the timing effects of those, and making changes every five minutes or so to try to bring that predicted line into target range. And I was helped by people to make the system for myself about four and a half years ago, and so it was no a no brainer for me to turn around and say, I want to make this openly available as well. And so we ended up creating a project we call Open APS, which stands for the Open Source Artificial Pancreas System, which was developed because we knew that once people heard that it was possible, we knew that other people would want to do the same thing. And we had spent a lot of time, in fact, an entire year, thinking about the safety design, about hardware and software, and understanding how quickly you could dose insulin to prevent a high blood sugar in the future, but balancing the more important short-term risk of avoiding a low blood sugar. So we actually put out a plain language reference design that explains all of this, in addition to a code repository and later documentation that says, if you want to do this, you have to decide yourself. It's DIY, 
but here's how you can do it. So there's now n of one times many doing this. But as we shared this in early 2015 with the rest of the world, we got quite a bit of pushback. And we were asked, well, you know, it works for you, but how do you know that it's going to work for anybody else? And the answer to this is what got me into more of the open science field, because I knew that it worked for me and I thought that it might work for other people, but we didn't know. And so in 2016, we actually did a survey of the community and presented a study at one of the big diabetes scientific conferences and then also published this in a peer reviewed journal and talked about the real world data and the evidence out there from the open source community. And so we started to get some traction both in the traditional scientific and healthcare communities and understanding what we were doing and why we were doing it, understanding the limitations, of course, of this is a DIY system, people have to build it themselves. You know, this is not necessarily something that's going to work for everybody, but for those who want to use it, you know, here is more data and information. And people in the healthcare world and the scientific world got a better feel for what we were doing to the point where a lot of people actually reached out and wanted me to share my data with them for research. And it was really interesting to be emailed about once a week and asked by other scientists and researchers if they could have my personal data for research. And it felt a little bit odd for a number of reasons, one of which is I'm not the only person that's doing this and I don't represent this community. I'm not the only person who's doing it. My data and my lifestyle doesn't necessarily match what the rest of the community is doing. Um, and we certainly don't necessarily represent the entire diabetes community. And there's now lots of people doing this. There are over a thousand people doing this. We think we have 10 million hours of experience in the DIY closed loop world. Um, so this is people who've chosen to use this and keep using it, even if they're only using it overnight or part of the day. Um, given that we've been around and doing this for so long, there's a lot of data out there from a lot of people. And so about a year and a half ago, a light bulb went off for me of there's got to be a way for us to gather some of this data in a way that prevents people like me from constantly being bombarded and asked for our data, um, but also to solve the problem of making sure that any data being studied about this community better reflects the actual community and isn't just a couple of one-off people who happen to be sharing um, their data individually. And so the solution we ended up using was working with a platform called Open Humans, which makes it very easy for individuals to donate and control their data and share it with projects. So one of the things we did was built a data transfer app. So individuals would be able to use the tool to anonymize their data and put it in Open Humans and decide to share it with a shared project like what we call the Open APS Data Commons. We then have a group who decides whether projects projects can access the data if they meet our criteria. And our criteria are not very hard or very complicated. Our criteria include making sure that if you find something that is, you know, something of like some notable result that you actually share it back with the community in a reasonable time. And the time frame is what is important to us. It's fine if you want to plan to go on and publish your results, that's fine, but we know the publication process can take a long time and there might be something that is affecting individuals today. So criteria number one is if you find something, share it back with the community, you can still you know, embargo it, go off and publish it, that's fine. Um, when you do publish it, to make sure that also your publication and sharing of any insights based on our data is done in an open and transparent manner. Ideally, that would be through open source, open access publishing. That's not always possible for all research groups, so it can also be solved by making sure a version is available directly to the community by talking openly about the results, even if the final exact version, you know, is behind a paywall, but making sure that data is available. And so as a result of making this data available to researchers, whether those are individual non-traditional researchers as well as traditional researchers, um, I've worked with probably several dozen over the last year and a half or so. And it's been really interesting to see the varied response we get because we get both people coming from the diabetes world who maybe have less technical expertise in analyzing data and building tools to work with data, as well as uh, more traditional tech or computer scientists or traditional researchers from another scientific field who want to apply some of their ideas to diabetes, but don't necessarily know that much about diabetes. And so some of my takeaways have been that a lot of researchers are unprepared to really take advantage of all the data that we have available from the real world. And a lot of them also have varying skill sets where they might be really, really skilled in one type of, you know, analytic tool or processing language, but maybe 
you know, can't deal with any data that doesn't come in a perfect format. So we are also started, and I say we, but this was primarily me, um, started to create some tools to help address these challenges. And I actually put together a repository with some documentation and tools to help people start to work with the data so that when I shared the data, I could also share a link to these tools to help people to begin to work with the data. And this includes everything from a basic script to unzip some gzip files and take the JSON data and put it into CSV because an early barrier was that many researchers weren't prepared or able to work with JSON data and they wanted to be able to open it in Excel, for example. So that script solved that problem. Um, and also people wanted to have an early insight into what kind of data was there to help design their research. So we have examples of the four main data files and examples of what you can do with the data. And I've also written some scripts that show people how to pull out pieces of information into one file coming from separate files for analyses, which again, depending on your expertise, may sound really, really simple, but this was a big, big barrier for both more tech researchers as well as diabetes-based researchers in even getting to the data. So we've had to solve a lot with open source software to make open research and open science more accessible to more people. And we're also working on some more tools, which I'm really excited about, one of which is a data access portal where instead of giving people a Dropbox link, with a copy of the data, they'll be able to log in, search through the data a little bit online, filter it, look at some analytics about the data set, look at some demographic data, download the format of their choice, whether that's CSV, Excel, uh, or JSON data, and then also get subsets of the data and not get the giant behemoth file of all the data for all the people of all time um, and just get the subset they want, which might make it a little bit easier. So there is a lot of research that's been done in the past. Um, one of the critiques we get in our work is that, okay, well, you know, you're doing this, but it's not in the peer reviewed literature. Well, yes, it is. We have plenty of publications and plenty of studies to date. And yes, some of these are retrospective or observational. Um, and we've got a variety of them that all show the trends in the same direction in terms of time and range goes up. The glucose outcomes all improve. Um, and there's a number of things that you can cite if you're interested in that. Um, but we've also been able to start to do some really interesting things with deep dives into the data and here's just some screenshots that show kind of a variety of the studies we've been able to do ranging from looking at outcomes data in the population to looking at social media activity and how that correlates with what this community is doing and seeing in terms of their healthcare outcomes but also looking at deeper insights that we can actually learn out of the data and things that nobody thought was possible to study looking at type 1 diabetes before because the closed loop gets rid of so much noise and because we've been able to develop all these new variables that we can track in real time over t over time and that's because we have a computer that we can design and tell calculate this at x time frame over time for people and so it's no longer re relying on somebody to self-track or analyze this data on the go it's their system does it for them it uploads it into this data commons it can be used for research and so it really removes a lot of the burden on the individual living with diabetes and so all of this combined, having built the system, having built the tools to enable this research and having done some of this research ourselves, I get really frustrated when I hear somebody say, yeah, well, you're, you know, you're not a scientist, you're not a researcher, you're not a healthcare provider. I think in healthcare and the traditional academic world, we spend so much time focusing on what people are not and trying to get people to stay in their lane for a variety of reasons. And it can be really, really frustrating because I think it's probably if you're listening to this, you're an advocate of open source and open science, uh, you understand that when we all pull together and share our skills and ideas, we can see a lot of movement in a short period of time. And what I like to remind people of is no, maybe I or others working in this space are not traditional, you know, engineer, programmer, scientist, whatever, but Honestly, the moment somebody gets diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, you're handed a vial of a drug, which is insulin, that can both save your life, but also has the potential to cause harm. And you have to walk that tightrope and balance that. And so from day one, a person with diabetes does become a scientist. They're constantly hypothesizing and experimenting and figure out what works well for them and figuring out how to incorporate in that life. And so whenever I talk to an audience that's not directly people with diabetes, but people who are thinking about open open science or open healthcare, open research, I like to remind people not to fall into what I call the patient syndrome trap, which is kind of like imposter syndrome, which you probably have heard of, which is where we feel like everybody else knows so much more than us. But what happens particularly in healthcare and science, when we think about patients or we think about citizen scientists or somebody from outside our field, it's very easy to think, well, we know as a professional way more than they know, right? Like they don't have our expertise. They don't have our years of experience. 
but honestly, what really is happening is that people know a lot that we don't know, and there is some overlap. But in healthcare and in science, we often focus on that small area of overlap rather than focusing on what we each know and can contribute and can figure out on our own. And so I think the challenge is, especially with healthcare and open source and open science, is to use people who you hear about, whether that's me or these other projects and tools that you're finding, and say, what if we don't think about these people as the 1% and as exceptions, but what if these people are actually the undiscovered rule? And I think a lot of things would change if we say, what if we're the undiscovered rule? How should we work with them? What should we do in order to encourage more um, in terms of providing resources and prioritization and mentorship and support? And I also think it's really interesting to see what happens when we actually enable people, whether that's patients or citizen scientists, to prioritize the research and designing solutions. Instead of just getting them to give input at the end like a focus group, what happens if we actually allow other people to help prioritize what work needs to be done compared to the, how it was done before? And I also think it matters that we surface and share resources openly to anybody, regardless of role of credentials. And I specifically say resources because sometimes it's funding, but it's not always funding. Sometimes it's data. It's about, like we have done, making data available and not limiting it to people you know who are a tenure track professor professor with this size lab and this much funding and this grant in order to see the data but saying look if you meet our basic criteria which you could do as a citizen scientist or as a traditional researcher at any level in your career what can be done how can you do it and how can we work together to get to that shared outcome and so one of the final things I just want to point out is just the difference in the process and the style of research. Because I think it's really, really common to want to research something that's polished and done, and it's something that we can really get our arms around and understand. But that's kind of like what happens with traditional innovation, and there's a lot of insight that gets overlooked. And so I would rather you start earlier in the process and understand the basics, the bare bones, the pieces that are coming together with our closed loop system, I actually didn't set out to build a closed loop. My original goal was to make a louder alarm. And once I got my data from my glucose monitor, I was able to make a louder alarm, but then I was able to make the prediction algorithm that then became the backbone of open APS. And so that louder alarm and accessing my data was my skateboard. And then my scooter was that first closed loop that I built. And then other people came along and have helped evolve it at every stage, but we're able Able to do so many more things with my self-driving car or open source artificial pancreas because we took all those steps and we learned along the way and we got help from other people instead of waiting and saying wait 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 until we're done you can't contribute till we're done you can't research until we're done so I encourage you to think about how with open science and open healthcare and open research we can think differently about the timelines as well as what we're doing differently and my final piece of advice to think about um, and my recommendations to people when they're thinking about open science and open research is specifically that you don't know what you can do until you try. And I've seen this to be true with so many researchers that I've worked with where they come in and feel like, okay, I've never done this before, therefore I can't even try. But the reality is there's a lot of tools and support out there, me included, if you want to work with my data set, I'm happy to help you figure out how to analyze the data, but I can't do it for you, otherwise I'd be doing it. Um, you have resources and insights and ideas and you might have to do something differently or do something new, but you absolutely can unless you don't try. So trying is key. And number two is recognizing that anything is better than nothing. And so don't wait until you have, you know, the perfect data set or the perfect tool to analyze the data set or in a couple of weeks or months or years, you know, it's so easy to say, like, let's wait for everything to be perfect and everything lines up in order to do something. But as we've learned in diabetes, it's so hard to wait for the next thing that takes five years to come to market. And there's a lot that can be learned in the meantime that can be shared with people in the community, that can be researched, that we can evolve our knowledge. And there's never going to be perfection, um, except for hopefully a cure one day. Um, but anything is better than nothing. And I think that also applies to science and research and what we're doing. And the other thing is remembering that small iterative changes are multiplicative. And so it's not one plus one equals two, but one and then one, and then you have a three. And it makes a really, really big difference if you start and keep going and you'll see a snowball effect on that. 
So with that, I can take questions and you're welcome to follow up with me anytime. You can see my Twitter handle is at Dana M. Lewis. My email address is Dana at openaps.org. Like I said, I would love for, if anybody listening to this is interested in checking out our data set and wants to work with it. If you want to PR tools back to my tool repository and help us make it better, anything like that would be great. But I'm also happy to chat anytime about open science, open research, and open healthcare. Thanks for listening.